Good morning, Harlan Sands, President of Cleveland State University. On behalf of all of us at CSU, it is my privilege to welcome you to our annual spring lecture series. Thank you very much, a great introduction and, uh, and uh, it's so good to be back with you. Um, not quite there fully yet, but a big step in that direction. And actually I hope in the next 12 months that I will be uh, there in, in person because there actually is so much going on uh, now that it's uh, heading towards, I'm, I'm gonna say, uh, just before hope rises is the way I think of it right now. So uh, even though uh, it has been shut down, most of the travel has been, uh, there's a, there are a lot of things going on and it's getting more dynamic. So I'm really glad that we can connect at this very particular time. Uh, I was amazed to hear uh, Debbie say we started in 2003. Uh, I didn't think it was that long ago, but it is, it is uh, worth noting that that literally is the first year where we began to look at system change uh, in England initially, and then in California, Ontario, in other words, uh, and where the whole system is implicated, whether it's a whole district or a whole state or sometimes a whole country. So we've come a long way together since uh, 2003. And I'm gonna say, I'll put the slides up in a moment, but let me just continue this uh, introduction a little bit to uh, more about who we are and what is our modus operandi. Uh, that we have, uh, I guess, about a dozen of us, uh, mostly based in Toronto, but we work all over the world, as you'll see. And uh, we mix and match in two broad teams, overlapping teams. One is on deep learning, the newer work, you'll see it in, uh, in, you know, in the course of the next uh, 40 minutes. Uh, the uh, deep learning that is, uh, how do you really uh, get changes that are suitable for the immediate future, the complexity of, uh, in fact, creating the future. And then we have uh, uh, another group called system change, which overlaps a little bit depending on what we're doing. But the system change is about how literally to team up with the three levels of the system, the local school, uh, districts uh, you know, in the middle, and also policymakers at the state level or even at the federal level sometimes. So we are uh, partnering that way. I've said many times, and it's absolutely true, that 80% of our best ideas come from leading practitioners. And that what we do is basically partner with groups, do things together. And then after some of it is done, I write a book or we write a book. And so the book is, uh, is practice chasing theory. It's practice driving theory. And that's, what, that's why it's so specific. I think that's why it's so, so good. So uh, let me then um, switch to the slides and I'll, I'll share these with you with Peter through a PDF later today, uh, but this will be the guide to uh, talking about just uh, framing it. And then we'll get into the question periods. The questions are predictably in the same domain and this is fabulous. So let's, um, let's get started on, uh, on this. And I wanna step back in the bigger picture to do this. Uh, the future is up for grabs is the way we put it. Uh, that uh, before uh, COVID, that is, let's say, December 2019 and back from there, uh, we, uh, I'll show you a couple of slides in this, but basically we and many others had concluded that the current school system in almost every country, Australia, where we work, uh, UK, US, uh, just, uh, Canada, uh, was increasingly stalled. By that I mean is a higher and higher percentage of students were not engaged in learning. Higher percentage of teachers were not enjoying uh, the role of the teacher because students weren't engaged. And the whole, the whole thing, uh, if not going backwards, uh, to a certain extent it was, was stalled. And I say that not, mainly uh, not as a criticism, but just to connote, as others have, that the system is not fit for purpose and has, has not been that way for at least 40 years. Some people say 100 years. But the fact is that the challenges are different now. We need a different system. But the, different, uh, the system was really lethargic in getting into that, uh, that change. So that's where we were before COVID. And then the good thing about COVID, if there is a good thing, is that, um, that it has uh, discombobulated every aspect of our lives uh, around the world, every country, everywhere. And this is a bad thing to a certain extent, but it's also a good thing because it reshuffles the deck or it's possible then when everything is uh, all over the place to think of it as what can we extract from this? What, what, what can, how can we use this as a catalyst for change? 
And our deep learning team has been uh, working on that. Uh, uh, that is how to, uh, what, uh, what is the current uh, situation? How can we be most helpful in the short run? And then how can we leverage change in, uh, in the medium to long run? And we have a lot of partners. Those partners are practitioners and policymakers. So that's where I wanna take you and the time I have uh, uh, with you uh, uh, between now and 1030. I mentioned that uh, education was at a standstill, that um, uh, this is, there's some various studies around here. Uh, I just cite one, uh, the Center for Youth at Stanford University continuously uh, is working with groups of students of all ages and asking them and uh, about how education is going, what do you need, uh, wh how is it performing, all of that. And they've concluded uh, that, uh, that about, only about 24% of and their amalgam of studies of students in secondary school, let's say grades uh, years 11 and 12, only about 24% have any sense of meaning and purpose about where education fits in their lives and where they're going in their lives. This is not about getting jobs. This is about just how do you approach life? And uh, I think that's, uh, that is accurate. That is, uh, we have a lot of people that were students that were not well connected for uh, uh, in terms of inequity, but also even those that were doing uh, reasonably well. In the last actually report I just did that's going to be released this Friday, I'll tell you about it towards the end of the presentation. Uh, one of the books called uh, Those That Were Doing Reasonably Well Academically, The Wounded Winners. That was the phrase that he used in his book that it wasn't all that great to be uh, on the high side either. So I think we have, uh, we have that. Here's a couple of slides that are what we consider to be the main reasons that things have stalled and from the point of view of the student, that, that we, we aren't uh, connecting students with purpose and meaning where they are, uh, that there's inadequate learning goals, the learning goals are not challenging enough or, or right enough, uh, that there's a failure to build relationships and belongingness. So this is, uh, you'll see in our deep learning, we've uh, attacked that directly to do something about that but it's a serious problem and it's widespread. And another uh, a mirror of this is this uh, from Jal Mehta, who's a professor uh, at Harvard. Uh, he did a big study with Sarah Fine about a year and a half ago, where they looked all over the, the country, the US, at secondary schools that were supposed to be into deeper, better learning. And their job, their grant was to go to these schools that pur purportedly were on the move and to capture it and, and write a book about it. Well, they went that and they found that these schools that were supposed to be on the move, on the, on the move actually weren't. And that uh, in fact, they called their book in search of deep learning. They were searching, but they still had to search more because they weren't coming up with much in the main. And these were schools that were pre-selected for uh, because they thought they were, uh, that they, they were more advancing in the deep learning. And you'll see what they, they flipped this around and said, what the system was not doing was this list of five things that, uh, that you see here, that the opportunities to work that has purpose and meaning, missing, that strong connections with adults and peers, not strong enough, relationship belongingness, that students should be uh, viewed as asset-based, but they felt they were just pawns or, or you know, just part of the, the testing mechanism system. Identities weren't valued enough. There wasn't, and this is a big one for us, it turns out that the opportunity to contribute to the world is not only a major motivator, it's a major core foundation of learning. You can't learn well unless you have an attitude these days of changing the world. So this was, uh, this was established as, uh, that's their version of it, it's identical to ours. And so the question is, where do you move from, from this? And, uh, and we had, I just put a footnote on this as well, because after this study, Jal, and Amanda Datna, which is this slide here. What they did was uh, they uh, were guest editors of the American Journal of Education, AJE. And you can go to this special issue. And what they did was they gave a call for uh, uh, research-based studies that were uh, within schools showing the new way. So that's what the, uh, they already showing the new way. So they went and they did that. Uh, they got a bunch of studies. They eventually published five of them, a research study steeply based and they asked me and Larry Cuban separately, individually, to comment on these five. And these uh, Jal and Manda commented. And all of us ha have the same obvious con conclusion. These were five jurisdictions that were supposed to be on the move. They were a little bit on the move, but they were, I'm going to say, blippy. 
that got started and then it fell back into the old routine. And that uh, the special issue we, we have, look up AJ, AJE in 2020, I have an article in there on, on my analysis of the fact it didn't change and why. And so does Larry Cuban and so does uh, Jell and, uh, and Amanda Datnow, the guest editors. So this is all showing we're not getting very far. If I think um, simply, and we have, a, uh, uh, have an orientation to this complex work of simplexity, I call it. You take uh, complex uh, systems you and, and problems, you break it down to the smallest number of meaningful points that cover the waterfront, but you don't want too many of those. You want five or six or something, not 12 or 14. And that uh, you show how those things cover the waterfront, are succinct and are specific and can be made to develop. So here's a common sense uh, version of that that you see on this slide, whole system success, I call it. You need the right content. By the right content uh, for us is the curriculum, uh, the six C's, the competencies, and the, uh, and the pedagogy that goes along with that. So the content of the solution is one of three things. You also need the right process. Well, what's the right process? It's basically leadership and culture, uh, collaborative cultures that are highly specific. The last five years, our work and other people's works that I'll show you have been highly specific examples of this kind of uh, uh, system work and, and practice. So very grounded, very specific. Uh, we have a number of sticky phrases that, uh, that are insights about change. And the one that fits here is strive for precision, but avoid prescription. So these are all sophisticated nuance, really, in the, in the book, I, I called it by that title. They're nuanced because what they do is they get closer and closer to the specificity of it. They, are, they capture it, but they don't impose it because in a change sense, imposition will never work because you'll never get it fully right. And even if you do, people won't buy into it that way. So we need, uh, we need then uh, the right process. And this slide just summarizes what I'm going to say now. Well-being and learning is the right content. These are the competencies. The right process is leadership and collaboration at the uh, three levels. And then the, I called the, the right wholeness, uh, and a, a kind of an awkward way of expressing it, but it's the way in which the local districts uh, uh, the local schools, the districts in the middle region, whatever the entities are, and the state level are, uh, are on the same page in this new report I just did on the choosing the, or the right drivers for system change that I'll introduce at the very end, and you'll be able to see when it's released on Friday of this week, uh, is really uh, tackles that. So this is the picture that I want to um, think about. This is what we're striving for, uh, well-being and learning, leadership and collaboration, uh, the middle being part and parcel of defining this. And then if I step one, this is the kind of last uh, couple of abstract slides I'll use. If I think about system change, which we've been working on, as I said, since 2002, uh, this is, uh, when we think about change, this is how I think about it now. And it's like, it's like the revolution, I guess I'll say. Uh, Thomas Kuhn wrote a very interesting book in 1962 called The Structure of Scientific Revolutions. So he said the existing model or paradigm, he called it, uh, which is the model that governs it. And let's think of education. He said, uh, change, revolution, upheaval or transformation occurs and, it, and two conditions are required. The first one we will all recognize, he said, he called it the cataclysmic uh, failure of the existing system. Well, you don't have to use dramatic language, but the existing system is failing. So condition number one, Thomas Kuhn is met. And then he said, the second condition is that there has to be an alternative, an attractive alternative to replace it. Uh, if you just have a bad system, there won't be enough change. You have to have a, a solution. The trouble with that from a change process point of view is the solution will never be fully formed until it's implemented. So you're, uh, to a certain extent, it, it, you're, you're, you're talking about what should happen. And it's harder to be convincing about what should happen you can convince people that the system isn't working, but you can't convince people that something is good if it has not yet happened. And that's what we're uh, in the midst of now is causing this stuff uh, to really happen. And we're getting there, but uh, this is the, 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 the takeoff. So the, um, the right content, again, just to underscore that, I'll get into this about our, our model in a moment and you'll uh, be able to see it in more details. I'll show you a video as well. So it is time to, uh, transform learning. We have been uh, stopped and helped by COVID. 
That is, we have stopped dead in our tracks by COVID in terms of, uh, of its, uh, uh, the, what I can say about COVID, uh, it's not a scientific word, but I'll say it's discombobulated the whole system, uh, top to bottom, everywhere, every, uh, every, uh, every level all over the world. So we, we, we know that. And we did, um, uh, we, uh, we, you'll see the way we're looking at this now, we're trying to help people deal with the transition, number one, but we're also saying within that, there are silver linings, golden pockets, whatever metaphor you wanna use, that we can actually use this uh, pulling back the curtain uh, to, uh, to do things that we probably would not have done had it not been for COVID. So one of the helpful things I'm gonna say we did is that uh, with Microsoft and UNESCO, uh, we did uh, report our team, our deep learning team, and we published this in uh, June uh, 2020, uh, uh, 2020 and June 2020, we uh, uh, it's called Education and Reimagine. You can get it from our, you can download it from us or from Microsoft. And in it, we have provided guidelines. We're now updating it about to publish a, uh, a, a new version uh, in June of 2021, which will be 12 months afterwards. And this is the four kind of, uh, uh, we're in the midst of this transition. I'm not saying, I'm not gonna rush reopening of schools but as part of what's going to happen in the next six months, uh, that the major point, be mindful of well-being. This has come, the good thing about COVID is well-being has been exposed. It's come to the fore as the, thi the, the thing, the foundation, and it is the foundation of our deep learning model before COVID. It's now even more legitimized. So uh, reflect on lessons learned. What we're doing now with a variety of school districts and systems is what have you learned? What are the do's and don'ts of what you've learned in the um, in in you know in the uh, in the COVID period of now almost 12 months, and then uh, as you go back into it, how can you make sure you deal with well-being, with mental health, safety operations, and then uh, accelerate into the learning agenda? That's how we're looking at it, and some of that I will be talking about as we go. We've had a big discovery uh, about well-being and learning, and it's. Uh, uh, partly, part and parcel of what we've been doing. Uh, we have a neuroscientist now on our team in the last two years. Her name is Dr. Jean Clinton. She's a, a professor of child uh, psychiatry in uh, McMaster University just outside Toronto. And uh, she uh, came to us because she said, I see the six C's that you're doing and what's happening. And it's so much uh, aligned with what I see in my practice with helping uh, uh, young children who are uh, who uh, have various degrees of problems, but I also want to see the positive solution, and I see it within your work. And where where we ca characterize it now is it's the DNA of learning. Uh, the DNA actually, I started to think this is a metaphor, but more and more I'm I'm convinced that it's a scientific analogy that when we take deep learning, which I'll define in a few minutes, and we think about well-being getting uh, well-being definition for us is getting good at learning and good at life. And we take those two things and they interact like a DNA uh, crossover uh, and, you, and relationships being the major uh, driver of this purposeful relationship, you get important things happening that are very fundamental. So uh, last part on, the, uh, on the, re uh, the transition, these are some of the questions we put in our education reimagined stuff. I just showed them to you. They're somewhat obvious, except they're quite organized to be specific, to allow you to pull out ideas. And for any group that you have, you can have students and other leaders in the system uh, pull out this lesson. I'm sure some of you will know this anyways. I hope this will be a more organized way of getting at it. So this is our uh, NP uh, New Pedagogies for Deep Learning. <clears throat> I can say that it's not a very great title. Uh, we kind of uh, stumbled into it in 2014. Uh, but uh, by new pedagogies, we mean, we mean fundamentally the teaching learning nexus. And uh, it's right, the new pedagogy is a little bit false in one way because there are good old uh, pedagogies, uh, teachers being close to their students. There are bad old pedagogies, teacher talk. When you come to new pedagogies, we are developing the new ones for sure that are effective, uh, but there are also new bad ones which are uh, using technology in a superficial way, et cetera. So this is about quality learning and we built the model and we, we no longer, I guess, have to justify that radically different learning is required now for the learning system, not to prepare you for life, 
but as John Dewey said uh, more than 100 years ago, that it is life, that actually the, the time distinction between learning and life is zero now. Uh, that is, students know that they're in life even when they're just uh, starting to learn. So our, our purpose, and we all, all of this I mentioned earlier, our modus operandi is always to team up with uh, this case, 10 countries and to uh, jointly uh, determine the nature and the evolution of what is needed to do this in a simplexity way, the smallest number of pieces. I can tell you now in our overall model, the smallest number of pieces that I'm gonna say are comprehensive are uh, 13. And these, uh, you know, using the math, <coughs> the first six are the global competencies. Uh, these, I, I'm not gonna dwell on them except to make a couple of key points about them. They, some of them were around for 30 years, like the 21st century skills. We've added character and citizenship, not as bolt-ons, but as integral to the model. In fact, character and citizenship have turned out to be catalytic to the, uh, to the changes that we're talking about. And uh, you'll see that these have sub-dimensions for all of our concepts, all 13 of them, six plus four plus three. They, we have uh, rubrics and, uh, and, and, and dimensions of this of going from earlier versions to higher. It doesn't mean people jump in and implement the six Cs, but everybody who works with us starts into some of them and they inevitably go to more. So this, this is foundational. This is the curriculum in a sense. This is the, uh, the content of the curriculum in our words, I might say. Then the process is really about uh, effective learning designs. And we have taken pedagogy, if you like, and elaborated on it, and uh, have come up with four elements that feed on each other that we think complete all the elements you need. And these are the key pedagogical practices. Uh, you'll see, certainly see them in the video that I show you. But th this, is the this is the teacher learner nexus. And it includes other people uh, and includes a greater partnership between the two. The second one is about partnerships, but not only partnerships between teachers and students, but among students, among teachers, and with parents in the community. Learning environment is the old classroom. Now our new classroom is the world if you like, but there's gotta be a local setting. And then we've taken technology and said, technology plays a role, let's put it in its place, that its role is to be, to leverage uh, digital to increase learning. It's, I, I've said before that technology is not a driver, it's an accelerator. The driver is the learning design that we have here. This, I don't expect you to read in detail, but you, uh, I'll, all of this is captured in our, our books, our two or three books that we published as a result of the last uh, four years work. And uh, these four, you can see some of the elements of them that uh, what we have people focus on, what they focus on in each of these four quadrants and how they inevitably, wherever they start, they might start in one quad quadrant and you know, eventually all, all four. So I'm gonna show you a, um, a video and ask you to think about when you see this video, Think about two things. Uh, one is, uh, what, what, six, what of the six C's do you see highlighted? Uh, what, what's going on here in terms of the competencies? And secondly, what's the pedagogy at work here? The learning design, the pedagogy when you get below it. Uh, Uruguay is one of 10 countries we work with. We have 700 schools there now. It's at the, you know, the foot of South America. It's got, uh, uh, it's not a big country, but it's got uh, about 3,500 schools altogether. And they've taken it on. And I just want to, uh, I've already asked you to look for the competencies, the six C's, look for the kind of learning design that seems to jump out at you. Uh, but I can say this to you, that what you see, what you'll see is uh, a few schools that got together within the deep learning re uh, reference. And they, they took on a problem, which was how do we convert rainwater into usable water? Because it was being wasted and they needed water. How do we do that? And how do you get a bunch of uh, students and teachers at schools and communities to pitch in and do that in a way that's very focused? And uh, this is what they did. I can tell you two years before this video, they were sitting at classrooms. You can imagine a you know, developing country, not many resources, sitting at a desk, very traditional, teacher at the front, workbooks, and all kind of passive learning. That's what they were like two years ago. So uh, take a look at this, and then we'll uh, move into... Uh, building on it.
El proyecto del año pasado fue todo un desafío. El problema que nos planteamos solucionar era el tema del agua para las plantas de la huerta. La camilla de la huerta se rompió y bueno, fue una problemática que pudimos, que se pudo trabajar. Decidimos juntar el agua que caía de los techos. El agua de la lluvia se junte y después la podamos usar para la huerta. A partir de allí surgió la idea de empezar a investigar en la escuela cómo, cómo cae el agua de lluvia, cómo cae en el sector donde hay techos. Y agarramos las tablas y salimos a buscar eh, lugares donde veamos que haya inclinaciones. Una propuesta grupal de ellos de exploración de lo que era la escuela. Eh, se va profundizando de a poco, se van como resolviendo pasos hasta llegar al objetivo final pero necesitábamos evitar el techo desde arriba. Y bueno, según las necesidades de cómo se va desarrollando el proyecto, es qué tecnologías vamos integrando. Y ellos mismos plantearon de, ay, si tuviéramos un dron, ¿cómo podríamos hacer? Poder ver la inclinación, si había mucha humedad. Primero programamos con bloques de papel y después con las tablets. Tomamos la foto en la puerta y arriba el chalón. Si nosotros tenemos que investigar cómo es la caída de agua, vamos a precisar una maqueta donde se pueda este, probar esa caída de agua. Primero comenzamos a medir la clase. Eh, medimos distancia y altura, el largo de los dos salones juntos. Estoy buscando alternar algunos instrumentos más convencionales con otros distintos, como por ejemplo sensores físico-químicos. Y después de eso lo transformábamos a escala. Y ahí armamos el prototipo de una canaleta. Una canaleta que esté eh, más alta para así llevarla al tacho. Todos los conocimientos que implican el uso de la huerta, lo que es geología, biología, también en matemática, porque hicimos las maquetas de los salones, tuvimos que dibujar escalas. Todos esos conocimientos que aparecen en el programa, ellos los hacían y los trabajaban, los incorporaban sin darse cuenta. Lo que me sucedió fue que entraba la mugre, el, como las hojas y los bichos, eh, en el recipiente al agua y lo pudieran escuchar, contaminar. Queríamos hacer como un filtro. Varios tuvieron varias ideas. Era como una especie de almacenamiento. Un plato con hoyitos para que pasase el agua, pero no lo demás. Y tuvimos que pensar un prototipo que gire como una paletita y saque todo por fuera. Esa parte la automatizábamos con los kits de robótica llamado Fisher. Entonces era como girarlo así y corrían las hojas que quedaban en el filtro. Implicaba ensayo y error, o sea, equivocarse, volver a empezar, cambiar, modificar. El error se habilita como un evento más dentro del proceso de aprendizaje. No se toma nunca como un fracaso. El plantear un problema e introducir una tecnología en beneficio de ese aprendizaje fue fantástico. Ellos vieron que realmente es una herramienta de trabajo y no solo un entretenimiento. Potenciando el pensamiento lógico, el pensamiento analítico y todo lo que es el pensamiento crítico, que es una de las cosas a las que apuntamos fortalecer. Al ellos encontrarse seguros y confiados en su trabajo, lograron también progresos en el resto de las áreas de trabajo. Que me gustó que podemos compartir distintas ideas. No hay no solamente la opinión de una, sino que de varios. Porque todos tenemos ideas y no somos todos iguales. Sacar individuos capaces de convivir, de opinar y respetar la opinión del otro. Ok, so one, another sticky phrase we have is uh, uh, when, people, uh, when people are working well together, they can talk the walk in highly spontaneous, specific, precise terms. And what you saw there is that talking the walk on the part of students and teachers, they didn't have to prepare to be filmed. They were just doing this stuff and they could talk, that's how they talked to each other. It, the clarity came tripping off their tongues. The specificity came tripping off their tongues. So this is, I've got a list here of six things that uh, uh, these, I'm not gonna read them out. You can see them and later on you can see the PDF. Uh, but this is what's happening, and uh, uh, we're not trying to recruit every school in every country, but we've got several districts in California, we've got several in Michigan, the biggest district uh, in uh, Utah, uh, Fort Wayne, Indiana, uh, some in, uh, in Rhode Island, and a lot of others where we're talking about these ideas uh, all, all the way through. So that, uh, and you know, I'll give you the, also the, how we've documented these in, in terms of the tools we're using, and, uh, and how you can access them. Uh, so this is uh, 
I should say about the tools, uh, uh, maybe if I go back to, uh, because I'm not covering all of this in this one hour. If I go back to the model that I described as 13 pieces, I've already shown you the six C's, you've seen the six C's in action. And then I've showing you, showing you the learning design four elements, that's the, uh, it takes us to 10. And the other three are uh, the infrastructure, I think I wanna call it, the collaborative and policy infrastructure. And three of them are intra-school, district or regional, and state policy. Those are the three. And we want those and we are the big, and when we're working systematically to have those uh, uh, completely involved in it, uh, in that full model. So uh, uh, there's a big issue in here uh, that the development of collaboration, I'm gonna give you some uh, specific insights that characterize the last five years. Uh, I've been working in collaboration or observing it for 40 years probably. And uh, there's a lot of good ideas and so forth, but it never had depth and specificity on any scale. PLCs came and they were, they were, they had the trappings of it, but they were very uneven. So what has happened recently, and I think it's because practitioners are leading it with us, is that it's highly specific. And we've captured this in our coherence work. And I wanna give you a flavor of what these findings are. Uh, on leadership, that success occurs when leaders participate as learners, talking about school principals, school superintendents, uh, that participate as a learner is a big thing. When you participate as a learner, you get what's number four here. This is Vivian Robinson's assessment of what do school principals do that increase the engagement of, uh, of teachers and students and, and get results of learning. And you'll see that they, he, uh, Vivian uses as John Hattie does, which we'll turn to in a moment, effect sizes with the guideline that an effect size of 0.40 or around there is statistically significant, but not very impressive. And an effect size, once it gives to 0.8, et cetera, it's got more uh, power. So here you see on uh, one, two, three, and, uh, and five, that they have puny effect sizes that we talk statistically. And uh, they're, they're good to have, necessary to have. But even number three, which is ensuring quality teaching, where, where what it actually is, is that the school leader tries to get uh, teachers who are highly effective into the school, but does it as a human capital strategy, not as a social capital or collaboration strategy. But number four is the collaboration. That's where uh, the leader is part of learning with students uh, or with teachers and others on what uh, development and collaboration looks like. There's a series of other specific findings in the last three years that say the same thing. Well, we, uh, uh, we met with John Hattie, we meet with him now and then, but a while ago, five years ago and said, all of your uh, visible learning uh, components are individualistic and they don't add up enough. If they were collective, they'd be more powerful. What do you know about collaboration and collectivity? And he said, well, we don't have much on that, but I'm gonna take a look at the research. So what he did was to look at uh, something he ended up calling collective efficacy and look at the effect size. I'll give you the breakdown of the four elements in it in a moment, but the effect size 1.57 blew everything away. If you go to his website uh, on visible learning where there are uh, about 300 uh, effect sizes and the rank order from those that are most powerful that those that are negative 300 of them 90% uh, of them are individualistic and some of them are great feedback to students, students into meta learning, that stuff. But also the ones that collective efficacy just jumped out and what collective efficacy, and these are Patty's words, not ours, that the schools or the systems that have collective efficacy, they have developed to get a shared belief and the collective capacity, they, they're confident they can get results. The reason they're confident, I think are the other three they think of evidence of impact as their driver. They have a culture of collaboration to identify and implement high yield uh, pedagogical strategies. And the leader, and this is leadership coming home, uh, leadership participates in frequent specific collaboration. This is uh, the key to that. And it's very powerful and very encouraging, I'm going to say. So uh, if you think about this in terms of intrinsic motivators, as, uh, as we sometimes do, uh, this is John, uh, from Dan Pink. The, uh, uh, when he wrote uh, the, the, you know, the deep learning <clears throat> book into, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, it was called Dive about five years ago. These are his words, but I want to map them onto ours. Sense of purpose is moral purpose. Mastery is capacity. 
degree of autonomy as our respect for individualism, we now, and I uh, just give about terminology, uh, John had a collective efficacy. Uh, Andy Hargrave's collaborative professionalism. And the word that we used recently, the concept is connected uh, autonomy. All three of these are identical concepts uh, that pretty much coincide, different terms, identical concepts. So there's a degree of autonomy as long as it's connected to collaboration and the connectedness you see the fourth one. So uh, uh, comment about uh, here, uh, external networks, my colleague, uh, uh, Lyle Kurtman, who's been identifying competencies of leaders that are especially effective. He has seven of them. This is the seventh one. Uh, the others have to do with internal development of schools or districts, but this one we wanted to capture because it's, first of all, it's verified. And secondly, look at it. It says, it basically says, if I use my sticky phrase, go outside to get better inside. Whether you're a school going outside or a district, you need to go outside. So uh, this led me to uh, uh, drop, drop into uh, uh, nuance. Uh, nuance was sparked by the finding or the observation I had that uh, a whole bunch of leaders seem to be using the same core concepts, vision, strategic plan, uh, implementation focus, uh, uh, feedback and all of that. But some of them were being especially, um, especially effective. And so you could almost say that if you look, you couldn't tell who was most effective by looking at what was on the wall or in the computer by, by way of the plan. The plan wouldn't tell you it was effective. But when you saw how these uh, people operated, in which I'm gonna un unpack for you here, you could, find, you could see why it's successful. And capturing the underneath why was the nuance. And I have in the book, uh, 10 examples, uh, vignettes, uh, case studies I'll sprinkle through. So I'm just gonna give you the essence of what nuance is. Uh, if I had to summarize it as what are the key strategies, there are three of them, they feed on each other. Uh, one of them is joint determination. That is uh, uh, any change, and I don't mean joint just at the front end, I mean all the way through implementation, reflection, uh, recalibration, that joint determination from leaders and others that work with them, absolutely key. Adaptability uh, as you go, makes sense, but it's key. And then the culture of accountability, which I'll catch up to later, uh, really, finally, we have, I think, a good, uh, a good definition for collaboration that was first surfaced by Richard Elmore in 2004. So that's where I'm heading for this. Uh, I, I, I found out quickly that uh, Leonardo da Vinci was the patron saint of nuance. And just as uh, his, his uh, uh, 600th uh, uh, anniversary was uh, happening when I was writing the book, so I, I, re I read more about him and, and appreciated that insight that he was really tied into detail. He could see the forest and the trees because he was within the trees, within the context, if you like. So this led us to the joint determination. Uh, the more complex the problem, the more that people with the problem must be part of the solution. Uh, Ron Heifetz says this in his adaptive capacity. And then I also dug up uh, a really great insight from a woman a management consultant in the 1920s, 100 years ago, Mary Parker Follett, who kind of was, got lost in history, but she focused and wrote about and did a, a unity of purpose. She called it forging unity of purpose. And this is a quote from her uh, that I used in nuance, in nuance. There can be no progress without unity of purpose. It's the same as joint determination, except this is a more of a human way of, of saying it. And she also said, and I, I think partly tongue in cheek, but not fully, she said, you need to, if you're a leader, you need to work on forging unity of purpose all the time at the front, all the way through, keep going forever because people are coming and going. The process needs to be this good. And then when she described it all and gave some examples, she said at the end of, uh, of this long description, and she said, and when you think you've got unity of purpose, don't expect it to last more than 15 seconds. Uh, mean big tongue in cheek, but she was begging to say, it's always fragile. Now, if you get it and you have cohesive leadership, you have the things that we have, we're talking about that reinforce each other, it's got staying power, but you can't assume or take it for granted. So that's very important. This leads us to think of always that implementation is about learning. It's about uh, that it's not implementing that I've got this thing I'm going to implement. It's rolling out a process and ideas such as our deep learning in a way where you're always co-learning and then consolidating. I mentioned accountability. I think we finally have a better handle on uh, Richard Elmore's uh, earlier 
2004 uh, comment when he said, no amount of external accountability will be effective in the absence of internal accountability. And so internal accountability, I think the best shortest way of saying it is if I take the characteristics of uh, internal accountability, which are these uh, four things that are in, in, in the culture is that improvement work exemplified by these four elements is identical to accountability work. It's just that you, if you do this internally, you're in a better shape to interact with the external accountability scheme. There are questions within there. So, and the question period, we'll get to some of this. This is Elmore's accountability part that I mentioned. Uh, uh, I've, I've mentioned a few sticky phrases. I'm just going to show you the, the kind of uh, array of them here. I've already mentioned quite a few. And these are all uh, insights about uh, coming from practice as we interact with the best examples uh, of this. Uh, one other finding and nuance, which I think is absolutely fundamental and is a new insight, at least in the way we put it, I call it contextual literacy. And liter uh, contextual literacy means you're literate about the culture that you're in, culture being the context. And, uh, and this, is, uh, this is a very important finding because it basically says these leaders who were effective, not just had good ideas, they heavily interacted within their system, which is participating as a learner. And they were experts on some things because they, they were hired for that purpose, but they also were apprentices on other things. They started to learn from other things. So, uh, and then this third bullet here, which is really uh, revealing, I think, is, uh, is that uh, when you move, as leaders sometimes do, uh, your new context makes you automatically de-skilled when you first arrive. And of course, COVID has swept the rug from under us. So we're all in a new context now, which means we're all de-skilled. And that's why it's so difficult because the, with the experience and the development of skill. So the modest thing, the humble thing is all leaders are always learning about context. The more the context is new, the more they have to learn. But as they master context, they become effective. And this is really uh, quite encouraging. Uh, so uh, this back to systemness, it's about coherence. Coherence is subjective. It's not alignment, it's the shared sense of purpose about the nature of the, of the work and that there's some really powerful things uh, in doing this. Uh, I'm not, in the last uh, five minutes I have here, I just want to uh, reinforce a couple of ideas about this. We have talked about, and Andy Hargraves has very specifically about leadership from the middle. And I wanna think about this as a, um, just as a picture, remember the middle for us uh, you can shift the middle depending on how complex the system you're looking at, but just just take the state and say that the state level is the top, the middle are the districts, the Greater Cleveland um, Consortium is a is a is the middle, and then the local individual schools. And we have said, okay, we've got these three levels. You have to think of each three each of the three levels that have a degree of autonomy and a degree of capacity independent of the other two. And if I put it into dynamic terms, which I've captured on this one slide, it basically says, if you're uh, higher up in the hierarchy, so to speak, your job is to liberate the next level down, purposefully liberal, shapes message, invests, interacts, intervenes. So you are, your mindset is I'm liberating the level behind me. And we can go from teachers are liberating students, principals are liberating teachers, districts are liberating and on, onward. So that's the, the, the subjective mindset. If you're looking upward, we, the concept we want to express is exploitation in the best sense of that word. My job is not to implement policy, it's to exploit in a proactive way policy at the other level that's valuable for my community. So there's lots in those policies that can be exploited in the best sense of that word. And that there's also a whole bunch of learning that lives in which means you need to interact laterally in your own level and then cross levels in this dynamism of that that we've uh, captured in recent ways is really how the system should look. So this is uh, about, about that systemness and I think we will get some changes when we get high percentages of people at each of the three levels who see themselves contributing to the betterment of the system and that there's good interaction within each of those three levels and across the levels. So to conclude, um, my latest uh, rendition of this, which is going to be released on uh, Friday of this week. Uh, so I'm not gonna tell you all the contents of it, 
but it, it is a report called The Right Drivers for Whole System Success. It's newer work than I've been able to describe up to this point. That is, it adds to what I've just told you. And this was an anniversary. It came about because I did a right drivers, wrong drivers paper 10 years ago, 2011. And the wrong drivers paper said a driver is a policy, a wrong driver is a policy that doesn't work. The wrong drivers uh, I did in that paper were uh, uh, net punitive accountability, uh, individualism, technology, and fragmentation. And then I had corresponding right drivers for that, but I developed, it was more a critique of what was wrong. And when the group uh, asked me to do an update uh, just a few months ago, they said, can you do an update? In fact, it was a superintendent in California where we were talking about, well, the policies, how, are, how helpful are they? How helpful could they become to be? And, uh, and she said, well, actually the policies coming around now are not very practical or not very clear even. Uh, not, leaving COVID aside, the, the uh, surround, what surrounds that, what preceded that was not very helpful. And she said to me, what we need is another driver's paper that we had, that you did 10 years ago. Well, I wasn't thinking of doing another driver's paper until that moment, uh, but then I, I got immediately interested and then produced this. Uh, uh, I won't tell you the drivers now, it's a bit of a secret. You don't have to wait for two days. Uh, and the, uh, and the, what I've really done on a macro level but has implications at all levels is say, we've got the wrong big drivers going. And these are the wrong big drivers. And here are the four, uh, the, here are the four positive drivers. And, but this time I'm not saying throw out the wrong drivers. I'm saying, let's see the rise of the right drivers and the dampening of the wrong drivers, but the integration of the two. Uh, so there are only eight, four pairs, you'll see them. And uh, I think they really do uh, take us forward. And, uh, and the reason I'm excited by it, aside from uh, where I think it's on the right track, is I think there's more, there are more takers now. The experience of COVID, the frustration of the last 10 years uh, has put people in a place now where there's much more propensity, I'm going to say, post-pandemic, uh, we will see, where to, to work on the solution, much more than had we just carried on without COVID. Uh, uh, absolutely positive spin-off of COVID is the uncovering of motivation was there, the discovery and the cultivation of new motivation, and the development on, on, a, on a collective basis of solutions that occur, not just individual schools now, but are gonna occur within a district, within a state, and uh, possibly uh, within the federal level. I'm meeting with the commissioners uh, on Thursday of this week, two days from now, the state commissioners. I, I haven't seen the list, so I don't know whether your state commissioner will be there, uh, but they've asked me as a group to meet with them to talk about how to uh, integrate and assess social emotional learning. Well, that for us is that just, that's just a piece. That's not how we would start. I want to surround that with a better formulation of that problem, and uh, we'll see how that works on uh, on Thursday with the commissioners. So this is an exciting time, and I'm really glad to be back with you at this uh, at this particular moment. And uh, and this is about engage the world, change the world. So I am um, very much looking forward to. You sent me five big questions in advance. They're uh, they're relatable to what I said, but. I'll turn it over to you and we'll shape the discussion period as we go from here. So thanks very much. Uh, I hope this hit home in some respects with you. I really look forward to the interaction in the next half hour.